I'm going to pray for Elizabeth and we'll get started. But one reminder, next week is the Wells Spring Break, which coincides with some spring breaks, but not all spring breaks, but it's our spring break. So don't come next week expecting to have a teaching in small group because there won't be anybody here. But we'll be back the week after that. Um, so just one week off, and you get two weeks to do next the next lesson, so you can spread it out a little bit. Um, and let me pray for Elizabeth so we can get started. Father, I thank you for the privilege of being here with all of these sisters. The beauty of your word, I thank you for raising up Elizabeth to teach your word. We pray that you would fill her with your spirit, that... Her words would be your words, that they would resonate deeply in our souls and help transform us more and more into the likeness of Christ this morning. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Mm. Amen. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm so glad to see you again. And um, I was telling some of the leaders this morning that as I've spent time digging into Leviticus 25, which I know you've all done for this past week as well, um, for me, this has just been a little known passage in my life, just kind of obscure, hidden, tucked away in Leviticus somewhere, not really something I ever would have known what, what Leviticus 25 contained if you just asked me. But as I've dug in, I've just, I feel like I feel this way each time, but this was just the best part. I just feel like I've seen God's heart so beautifully on display in this passage. And it just seems like when we see his heart, um, it just has everything to do with our lives. And so I'm really excited about Leviticus 25 this morning. I'm excited to talk about it with you. And... um, I really do think, because we see his heart so clearly here, that this has everything to do with us. Um, So Lord, just show us yourself, that we can adore you um, as we see your heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, So we're going to see God's sovereignty, his deliverance, his mercy, that he is present with his people. He's caring, he cares. I think this is giving feedback. Can you hear it? I hear it. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. And that he is powerful to provide. Psalm 140, 12, plus many other places in scripture, tell us that the Lord secures justice for the poor and upholds the cause of the needy. And we're going to see that on display. And ultimately, that's us, right? I mean, spiritually, we are poor and needy. We need him. What a comfort. It makes me think of Psalm 46. He is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And what a call to accountability this passage is for all of us, to to learn of him and to image him in this way. And we're going to see our very own great and certain future hope that the year of Jubilee points to. So yes, this passage has everything to do with our lives. And so let's draw near to our God as we dig in to this passage. So one orienting sentence that I want to start us with is that our God is a redeeming, restoring God. And this fact should shape who we understand ourselves to be. It should shape our reverence for him. And it should shape how we treat other people. You and I were bought at a price, graciously, lavishly. And so we are called to mirror the image of our Redeemer. So the portions of our text that we're going to look at today are the Sabbath year, the year of Jubilee, and then um, a few different parts that talk about treatment of the poor. We'll see portions on redeeming land and redeeming people. So let's dig in. Um, Verse 1 says, the Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai. So right there, we learn that this portion of Leviticus was probably likely given to Moses earlier than the other parts um, on Mount Sinai, not instead of in the tent of meeting. But it was placed here um, at the end of Leviticus, since these instructions relate to what we just talked about with the Sabbath, which Aaron led us through, and these instructions pertain to when the people enter the promised land. So looking forward to that. And if we keep reading in that verse, we see, the Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land that I give you, 
bam, that is orientation right there. Not if, but when you come into the land, and it's the land that I give you. So he's doing it, he's bringing them, he's giving it. The indicative is preceding the imperative in this passage. So I'm a big grammar buff, much to my family's dismay, and I love grammar. Um, So if you remember that indicative verses just simply talk about what is, whereas, I mean, not verses, uh, verbs. Indicative verbs state what is. Imperative verbs state a command. And so in scripture, we have the indicative, what is, what God has already done, preceding his commands to his people. And that is the case right here. So as we look um, at the Sabbath year passage, we see that when they come into the land, the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. For six years you shall, six years you shall sow your field, and for six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather in its fruits. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall not sow your field or prune your vineyard. You shall not reap what grows of itself in your harvest or gather the grapes of your undressed vine. It shall be a a year of solemn rest for the land. So when they enter the land, they're going to farm it for six years. And they'll, they'll plant seeds, they'll prune their plants so that they're more productive, more prolific, and they'll have a formal harvest. But every seventh year, they will allow the land, or they are commanded to allow the land to rest. There should be no planting seeds, no pruning their plants, no formal harvest during that seventh year. Just low-scale, hand-to-mouth gathering uh, what the land produces of itself. So this followed the pattern that the Lord himself set in creation. For six days he created, and on the seventh day he rested. And we already know, we've already looked recently at how he called his people to follow this pattern in their week, to work for six days and to rest on the seventh. Aaron led us through that rhythm. So now we see God take this principle and extend it to include entire years. Now, biblical scholars say that keeping the Sabbath was the fundamental sign of covenant loyalty. That God was saying, keep this out of faithfulness to me and as a sign of keeping all the rest of the covenant. And practically speaking, it protected the land and the people from overwork. It gave the land, the animals, and the people an extended period of rest and refreshment. Now, there are two significant aspects of this. One, it allowed them to briefly escape the curse of the ground. If you remember back to Genesis 3, after Adam and Eve sinned, um, the ground was cursed. It would produce thorns and thistles, and through painful toil would man eat of it. So this Sabbath year was allowing a brief escape from that curse. And two, it gave them enjoyment of rest that foreshadowed a far greater experience of rest in him that was yet to come. And spoiler alert, we're going to talk about that um, we're gonna, in a uh, couple weeks looking at rest in Hebrews. Now, this applied to the resident alien workers too, showing that the Lord's love extends to all people, Israelite or not, and his care was for the land and the animals too. The Lord, as creator of all things, is king over them, as Psalm 95 tells us. We know that the cattle on a thousand hills are his, and he shows his loving care to all, whether the land, the animals who dwell in it, the foreigners who work in it, or the Israelites he calls to tend it. The Lord's care is not limited just to humans, and certainly not just to Israelites. It's as broad as the creation itself. And the Israelites, as his covenant people, are to show this same care for everything in their father's world. And one way he instructed them to do so was to allow the land to rest every seven years. So the indicative preceded the imperative. He redeemed them. He rescued them out from Egypt and would give them this land. And so what did he then call them to? Well, in this portion of our text, to let the land rest every seventh year. Now, what did this require? Trust. Because just think, this would be like someone today giving up pay for an entire year, every seven years. Only more so since there was no natural guarantee that the harvest of the eighth year would be good. The Israelites could do this, however, 
knowing that the Lord had promised to provide. Let's look at verses six and seven. The Sabbath of the land shall provide food for you, for yourself and for your male and female slaves, and for your hired worker and the sojourner who lives with you, and for your cattle and for the wild animals that are in your land. All its yield shall be for food. Okay, so letting the land rest would therefore be a bold proclamation of faith that the Lord would be faithful to care for the needs of those who followed him in this. And doesn't this just, this just make you think of the manna? Um, if you remember from our Exodus study, for those that were here in the well a couple years ago, um, God provided bread from heaven every morning, like dew on the ground, for the people to collect. They could only collect enough for that one day. If they collected any more and tried to save it for the next day, it would spoil overnight. Because they were supposed to trust him to provide that next day, too. But what about on the sixth day? Then they were to collect enough for two days so that they didn't have to gather on the Sabbath. And miraculously, that night, it would not spoil, and they could eat it on the Sabbath. And so what principle do we see at work in that passage and then in our passage today? That God has committed himself to provide at just the right time for his people. And so he calls us to trust him and therefore obey. The New Testament reinforces this. Jesus himself says in Matthew 6 that we are not to be anxious, but to trust God to provide what we need. Matthew Henry says of this passage, the Israelites were brought to live in constant dependence upon the divine providence, finding that as man lives not by bread alone, so he has bread, not by his own industry alone, but if God pleases, by the word of blessing from the mouth of God, without any care or pains of man. All that we have is from God. Dependence, trust, and obedience are to characterize our walk with him. And as a mom, can I just say this really touches down for me in that realm. I can trust God to provide for all that my children need. I don't know how many of you need to hear that today, but it always is something I need to hear. He will be reliable for them. Okay, so we're going to move on in our passage to the year of Jubilee. Okay, the year of Jubilee, y'all, this is a big deal. Think once a generation significant, like a 50th wedding anniversary. So we're going to read uh, verses 8 through 12. You shall count seven weeks of years, seven times seven years, so that the time of the seven weeks of years shall give you 49 years. Then you shall sound the loud trumpet on the 10th day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement, you shall sound the trumpet throughout all your land, and you shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you when each of you shall return to his property and each of you shall return to his clan. That 50th year shall be a jubilee for you. In it you shall neither sow nor reap what grows of itself, nor gather the grapes from the undressed vines. For it is a jubilee. It shall be holy to you. You may eat the produce of the field. So we know that the number seven is significant in scripture. It signifies completeness. So it's not surprising that after seven portions of seven years, so 49 years, there is this crowning Sabbath with extra special benefits for the people of God. So this was another rhythm that God gave his people. Every 50th year, there would be the Sabbath of all Sabbaths. It would start with a trumpet blast on the evening of the Day of Atonement. And that's where this name Jubilee comes from. It's derived from the Hebrew word yobel. I may not be saying that exactly right. Um, Which refers to an animal's horn that has been made into a trumpet. And it's likely that such a horn was used to initiate this significant year. It was in their fall season at the end of their harvest. And it was initiated on what was already a day of rest, the Day of Atonement, and the people in the tabernacle having just been cleansed, it was an entirely appropriate time to start a holy year. So liberty was proclaimed for all its inhabitants. Everyone returned to his own property, and in so doing, everyone returned to his own clan or family. And again, it would be another Sabbath year, another time when they would neither sow nor reap, but eat on a low-scale, hand-to-mouth gathering kind of way. 
So I want to take a second to first briefly describe how life worked economically, because I think that will help us make sense of um, some different portions of the text that are coming up. So at this point, we've got a slide that will show us the land allotment for each tribe. Each tribe was assigned a specific land inheritance from the Lord upon entering the promised land. So um, we're just going to use the example of crop failure as one scenario that um, could describe how someone could go from um, being an allotted owner of land to becoming so poor that they no longer had it. So um, they would need to purchase seed to plant their crop. Now, if they had a bad harvest one year, the crop failed, um, then they wouldn't make a profit or the profit that they expected. And if they had no savings, they would have to borrow money again to buy seed for the next year. But maybe there would be another bad harvest, and then they might have to sell some of their land to cover their debts, as well as borrow more money for seed. And then if that crop failed, the person might have to sell off the remaining land to cover that debt. If significant debt remained, the only remaining option would be at that point to sell yourself, to go into servitude, to pay off debt, and to have provision like food. The work would hold an economic value that is paying toward debt. So that is what's in view as we're going to discuss um, redemption of land and redemption of a person. So... This is the context for the year of Jubilee. The year of Jubilee was a huge culture shaper for the nation of Israel. Everything was viewed in light of it. Every 50 years, so about once a generation, the nation would experience a complete reset. They knew how long until it was coming. They knew how long it had been since it last came. And it determined sell prices for land and people because prices were based on how many harvests a buyer would have the opportunity to benefit from, whether from land that they were using to plant or from a person's work and serving. Now, biblical scholars say that the Jubilee makes the Lord's priorities for humanity clear. It's a place where we see God's values on display in a very clear way. Remember, laws represent the values of the lawgiver. So what values do we see of God from this? Well, we're going to see liberty for his people, ownership of land or place for his people, the value of close family relationships, fear of the Lord, and rest based on trust in his provision. So let's take these in turn. Liberty. So what does it mean for liberty to be proclaimed throughout the land to all its inhabitants. Well, it meant that every Israelite that had sold themselves into servitude because of poverty would be released without any repayment of remaining debt. They would just go free. This was a big deal. Other ancient Near East cultures sometimes had similar releases, but they were sporadic based on the whims of a king's determination perhaps when he rose to power to earn favor, or perhaps if there was a crisis. But by contrast, the divine king of Israel set up a system of release at fixed intervals, which was not dependent on arbitrary human leadership. Release for his people was guaranteed. Now remember, so often in the Old Testament, physical, concrete things point towards spiritual realities in the New Testament and help us understand them better. And just like this declaration of liberty came on the evening of the Day of Atonement, our freedom in Christ comes after his atoning sacrifice on our behalf. The Lord was acting as their redeemer, their rescuer. Sklar says, it is a characteristic of the Lord to redeem people. He had redeemed the Israelites from slavery in Egypt to be his people, and now by this law, he redeems them from their debts. This law effectively abolished permanent servitude of one Israelite to another, unless they so chose um, because they were so well provided for. That's a caveat, a special situation you can see in Exodus 21. But otherwise, it abolished permanent servitude. And why? Because they were the Lord's servants. He had redeemed them. That was the indicative. And therefore, it was to him alone that they were to belong in this way.
And um, again, we see this physical, concrete Old Testament example pointing to a spiritual reality in the New Testament. Galatians 5.1 says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. 1 Peter 2.16 says, Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. So it's not that we're free from following God, but free to follow God. So everyone who owed anyone anything was to be completely freed from their debts. Now, just imagine being the one who had to let that debt go unrepaid. <clears throat> sacrificing your own gain for the benefit of another. The unrepaid would be giving dignity to someone who is lower than them in society, honoring them, just like Jesus who took death for us at great cost to him and forgave us our debt. We were enslaved to sin with no way out, and Christ came to set us free and give us new life. He canceled our debts. He has shown us his character, and he calls us to image him. 1 Corinthians 13 tells us to keep no record of wrongs. And even when Jesus was teaching his disciples to pray, he taught us to pray, forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. So we can apply this in a spiritual way in the New Testament. And now. Um, So the second uh, value of the Lord that we see is return to land. It says, each of you shall return to his property. So practically speaking, what did this mean? Perhaps you had the very reasonable question that I had. If everyone always returns to their family's land in the Jubilee, how does anyone else ever own it? How is any sale ever final if the land always reverts back to the tribe that God originally gave it to? I mean, I really had that question. Well, friends, come to find out, that's the whole point. (laughs) God had assigned each tribe its inheritance from him. Remember, the land is his, and it was meant to remain their inheritance. We see his protection of his ongoing gift of land to each tribe. Now, in terms of hyperlinks, doesn't this just make you think of an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, 1 Peter 2, 4? We looked at that last year, if you were in the well then. So again, another physical, concrete thing in the Old Testament, pointing to a spiritual truth in the New Testament. Okay, so the land belonged to God. This indicative justifies any imperatives he ordains for it. Sklar says, the Israelites are servants on the estate of the divine king who owned the land and was entrusting it to their care. It was not ultimately theirs to own, but to care for and use in a way that honored him. And what honored him? Obeying his instructions. We've seen regarding times for it to rest, and here, following his prescribed times for its return to the tribe or family to whom he had given it. Practically speaking, ownership of land was important because it was tied to economic well-being. Land enabled people to provide for their needs by growing crops and keeping um, herds and flocks. And this shows us the Lord's value of equity and opportunity. This was not socialism because they owned their own land. But it also wasn't unchecked capitalism because it prevented a wealthy few from accumulating most of the land over time. This was intended to prevent the creation of a feudal system in which increasing numbers of poor serfs served a small minority of rich landowners. It restored the opportunity for family units to provide for themselves again. We have been created to work. Remember, work is, was pre-fall. And therefore, we should promote a society that makes it possible to meet that need. And doesn't this just wipe away the idea of striving I think striving is this constant, silent, or maybe not so silent, backdrop of our culture today. But nothing that we have belongs to us. It all belongs to God. We are stewards. He provides. We do not have to strive and grasp. God is the provider for our needs. We should put our trust in him. The third value that we see is return to family. Close family relationships were important because the Lord had appointed the family as the foundation of society. 
The personal and social benefits of strong families have been established repeatedly by modern studies. The Lord wanted these benefits to be woven into the fabric of Israelite society, both to bless the Israelites and to model for the nations what society was to look like. So it was very important that people be able to return to their families. So how exactly did the Jubilee protect the family unit? Well, close family relationships and land ownership were both threatened by debt. It could force the Israelites to sell their land and move away from their extended or even their immediate family members. The laws of redemption and Jubilee provided cancellation of debt, enabling people to go back to their own clans and to the property of their ancestors. So by eliminating debt, which could separate families, social disruption and decay were kept at bay by preventing the situations that contributed to problems like crime, poverty, and violence. The fourth value that we're seeing on display in the Jubilee is fear of the Lord. Again, the time until or since the last Jubilee was to shape the prices for land and people services that were being sold since the price was to be based on the number of harvests a person could expect to get, and they were to price fairly. We see in verses 16 and 17, if the years are many, you shall increase the price, and if the years are few, you shall reduce the price, for it is the number of the crops that he is selling to you. You shall not wrong one another, but you shall fear your God, for I am the Lord your God. Theologically, the basis for these commands was that the land and the Israelites belonged to the Lord. It was acknowledging they would give account to him for how they treated the people. We know from elsewhere in scripture that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And here, these people were to treat each other in light of whose they were, his. Out of reverence for God, they were to treat their brother. So reverence for the Lord was meant to translate into right treatment of my neighbor. The command to fear God is appropriate. It is given to remind those with power that there is a far greater authority to whom they must give account. We've already spent time in Leviticus 19 this semester where we saw you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so now we're basically seeing this principle principle applied in an economic context. And the New Testament reinforces these ideas. Really, this comes down to love. Jesus says in John 13, 35, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Okay, moving on to the fifth value of the Lord that we see in the Jubilee is rest, based on trust in his provision. So this is another year of Sabbath rest and not working called in trust called for trust in the Lord to provide. And we see God promise just that. He promises to provide for the needs basic to abundant human life. He makes these promises to those who embrace the covenant from the heart. His promise of provision is meant to translate into trust. And that trust is meant to translate into obedience from the heart. Even in the case of a Sabbath year pushed right up against a year of Jubilee, he says... And if you say, what shall we eat in the seventh year if we may not sow or gather in our crop? I will command my blessing on you in the sixth year so that it will produce a crop sufficient for three years. When you sow in the eighth year, you will be eating some of the old crop. You shall eat the old until the ninth year when its crop arrives. Whatever the timing, the overall point is clear. The Israelites can obey the Lord's command boldly because they know he will provide for their needs. He's a truth speaker and he's faithful to do what he says and he's powerful enough. He's able to do it. Now this just makes me think of an illustration of myself recently where I was in a situation where I was moving some heavy furniture with some friends. It was only women and we needed to move two heavy pieces of furniture down a tricky staircase. Well, the first time um, there was uh, my friend who is stronger than I am was in the place of most importance and all was well. She, she, she kept the rest of us safe, right, coming down this stairway because she didn't release and let, and let this heavy piece of furniture go onto the rest of us. Well, 
she had to leave. And so then it came time to move the second piece and we all go back upstairs and we kind of non-communicatively just like position ourselves around. And I realized I was in the spot like that she had been in. And I just was, I was like, I am not trustworthy for this role. Upper body strength is not my strong suit, no pun intended. Um, so I quickly spoke up and was like, I can't be trusted in this role. And I think that just like speaks to our point here is that our trust in something or someone has everything to do with how trustworthy they are. And God was trustworthy to do what he said he would do here. Okay, so in sum, y'all, the year of Jubilee was the best thing since Eden. Just think of the picture that emerges. All the Israelites would return to their own land, surrounded by their own families, having no debts, enjoying a year of Sabbath rest, looking forward to years of safety and prosperity in a land flowing with milk and honey, living in soul-satisfying fellowship with their covenant Lord, the one they acknowledged as sovereign over the land and themselves. This is what Sklar is describing. What does this sound like? The year of Jubilee looks backward to Eden, but it also looks forward to heaven. Mm. Sklar says this has always been the Lord's intent for humanity, and now Israel is privileged with showing this vision to the nations and inviting them to experience it. Okay, so we're going to move on now to the next portion of our passage today, which is on redemption of property. Now, um, if we look at verses 23 and 24, it says, The land shall not be sold in perpetuity, for the land is mine. For you are strangers and sojourners with me, and in all the country you possess, you shall allow a redemption of the land. Okay, so why is redemption of the land in view here? Why is it not to be sold in perpetuity? <clears throat> because it is his. And he, as we already looked at before, had given it to these specific tribes as their inheritance. So if an Israelite becomes poor and sells his land, there is this threefold instruction for it being restored to him. And we're going to see this same threefold instruction in the case of a person becoming so poor that they sell themselves and, and when they get redeemed. So the first it, um, of this threefold instruction is that their nearest redeemer can come redeem them. This is the idea of a kinsman redeemer, which um, you may be familiar with if you've read the book of Ruth. It comes to bear beautifully in that story. The second way that a uh, land can be redeemed is that the man can do it himself if he makes enough money. And lastly, if the first two options are not possible, God himself has intervened by instructing that the land is to be returned to its original owner at the year of Jubilee. And so now we just have these three very specific scenarios, and these are details, and we'll take these in turn. And so I'm going to have a slide that comes up that shows us houses, or what a city might look like, a walled city that had houses inside, and then there are houses in the villages surrounding that walled city that had fields and pasture land associated with them. And so that's what is in view in this chunk of our passage, where you read those details. So houses that were in the villages outside that walled city were classified with the land or the fields, and those followed these redemption Jubilee laws. This does not apply the same to houses inside walled cities. Those can be redeemed within a year, but then they do belong in perpetuity to the buyer. Now, why? Sklar says this law graciously provided the seller a chance to get the house back without putting an unfair burden on the buyer. That's as much as I understand of that, <laughs> okay? Um, now, the Levite situation was different. Um, our passage says, the Levites may redeem their city houses any time, and they are never to sell their land. Remember, the Levites were the priestly tribe that did not receive a territorial land inheritance. They, didn't, they weren't on that map of all the territories. Why? Because the Lord himself was to be their portion. He was their inheritance. Instead, they received the tithes of the Israelites for their support. We've already looked at food in the offerings. 
as well as 48 cities that were allotted to them out of the inheritance of the other tribes. So they had 48 cities scattered among the other tribes, which makes sense if you think of it. This was so that they could be scattered among the other tribes in order to serve them for the purpose of ministering to them as priests. They didn't need to be tucked away in their own zone. They needed to be out there where they were serving. Okay, so those are those specific details. Um, But now we're going to turn and move on to the redemption of people. And so we have three scenarios in view here. The first is an Israelite in service to another Israelite. The second is a foreigner in service to an Israelite. And the third is an Israelite in service to a foreigner. So let's take these in turn. Our first scenario is an Israelite in service to another Israelite. We're looking at verses 35 through 43 here. And we see that if an Israelite becomes poor and cannot support himself, his fellow Israelites were to support him. They were not supposed to charge interest or make a profit. And what was to be their motivation? Their own deliverance by God, his generosity toward them, fearing him. God has been generous to you. Imitate him, is what he's saying here. Psalm 120 verse 1 says, In my distress I cried to the Lord and he heard me. This was a chance for them to image the character of their redeeming God and how they cared for one another. What else is in view here? Love. And just as this passage points to serving their brother out of reverence for the Lord, so Jesus in Matthew says that when the Son of Man comes, truly, is this still on? He will say, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. God is showing himself as their deliverer, their refuge, and how he is commanding that they be cared for. So how was this to look? They were to serve as a hired worker for a limited time until the Jubilee. And then they were to return with their children to their own land. And Deuteronomy even speaks of sending them out lavishly, liberally furnished from their own flock. So there's this, there's this emphasis on their identity as God's servants because he redeemed them out of the land of Egypt. So the indicative comes before this imperative. They were his. And so there's this prohibition on them being permanent servants because they are his servants. And for this same reason, there is a warning not to treat them ruthlessly, but to fear God in treatment of them. Okay, now the second scenario that we get to is in service to Israelites. So um, we're going to read verses 44 through 46, and I want to take time here, honestly, because this is a difficult portion of our scripture. And I think if we're spending a year in Leviticus, we want to like really, we want to really spend our time and know God's heart here. And it's easy to um, misunderstand this. So we're going to let scripture interpret scripture and look at the whole counsel of scripture as it pertains to this portion. So let's read it. As for your male and female slaves whom you may have, you may buy male and female slaves from among the nations that are around you. You may also buy from among the strangers who sojourn with you and their clans that are with you who have been born in your land, and they may be your property. You may bequeath them to your sons after you to inherit as a possession forever. You may make slaves of them, but over your brothers, the people of Israel, you shall not rule one over another ruthlessly. Okay, this is one of the, I'm not going to mince words. This is one of those passages that makes Leviticus feel like the evil cousin we want to keep hidden in the closet. I know that most of us really sincerely hope our unbelieving friends who have finally decided to give the Bible a chance won't flip open to this passage, right? Because it is so easy to make incorrect conclusions if we read this without any help. Sisters, I just want to say I've been so blessed at the way that looking at the whole counsel of Scripture um, helps us understand God's heart in this passage. So let's dig in with the help of biblical scholars. So Jay Sklar and um, John Harris of um, Living Waters Europe Ministry have been super helpful to me on this. And I'm just gonna tell you, if you're a note taker, don't even bother right now. I'm gonna go so fast because we don't have time. And I'll send you anything. 
slides, uh, whatever. I'll be glad to share it with you. I don't want you to get frustrated when I fly through this. Okay, the word slave. For us, that word, that's hard. Like, that's just straight up hard. That word is misleading because it calls to mind morally illegitimate forms of servitude, like the African slave trade that happened in America. That is chattel slavery, where it has no rights, and slave owners assume that they are free to do with the slaves as they wished. That is not what is going on here. Um, the term abed, E-B-E-D, and we're going to look at that, is more helpful, more accurate, our understanding. Now, translators sometimes use the word slave instead of abed. And we're going to talk about there's four morally legitimate kinds of abed service, being a king's servant, being God's servant, an indentured servant, or a permanent servant. These last two examples are where translators have sometimes chosen to use the word slave um, instead of in that, in that place where that Hebrew word abed was in the original text. So let's look at a couple of other passages where this word is used. Um, we're going to flash through this super fast. My servant abed, Moses, he is faithful in all my house. After these things, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant abed of the Lord, died at the age of 110. Let my people go that they may serve abad me. So seeing Moses and Joshua and God's cherished people described with this term um, is helpfully disarming. It reframes our, our perception of this word. Now we are going to, now in our passage, we're talking about foreigners in that role of servant. So let's hone in on those details. We're going to see very clearly that slavery as we imagine it was forbidden to the Israelites. First of all, there was to be no kidnapping. We see anyone who kidnaps someone is to be put to death, whether the victim has been sold or is still in the kidnapper's possession. The slave trade as we think of it could not have happened without kidnapping. What is in view in our passage is people who have willingly, voluntarily entered into service. Slaves had legal rights in Israel. What we think of as slavery involved a slave trade master getting money for this person's um, life and service. What the Bible is referring to here, the person is willingly entering into servitude so that they can have needs met, um, like food and a place to live. That is so different. Rather than buying or selling people, what is in view here is paying someone for their services. And I want us to listen to God's heart in a few verses to come. We see love and compassion. I'm going to rapid fire through these. When a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Do not mistreat or oppress a foreigner, for you were foreigners in Egypt. Do not oppress a foreigner. You yourselves know how it feels to be foreigners, because you were foreigners in Egypt. Cursed is anyone who withholds justice from the foreigner, the fatherless, or the widow. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. And you are to love those who are foreigners, for you yourself were foreigners in Egypt, and there are more. And what's the kicker from our very own passage today, which we didn't read yet, but it's verse 35. If your brother becomes poor and cannot maintain himself with you, you shall support him as though he were a stranger and a sojourner, and he shall live with you. This was used as the standard to show how to provide well. Um, the, um, how, providing well for the Israelite among them, um, yeah, the standard of that was the way they cared for a stranger and sojourner. Now we're going to see also on our next slide that Slaves went free if masters abused them. It says, when a man strikes the eye of his slave, male or female, and destroys it, he shall let the slave go free because of his eye. If he knocks out the tooth of his slave, male or female, he shall let the slave go free because of his tooth. They had a right to rest on the Sabbath. The seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. They were included to rejoice at spiritual celebrations. You shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, the Levite who is within your towns, the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are among you, at the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell there. You shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and you shall be careful to observe these statutes. All of the above. 
is showing the opposite of dehumanization. We see dignity and we see protection. Now, a second thing that can be difficult for us is this use of property language to describe servants. So when we read in verse 45 and 46, they may be your property. You may bequeath them to your sons after you to inherit as a possession forever. This is servants being described with terms normally reserved for property. And that's, that's hard for us. We don't know how to take that. Now that suggests to some that they were viewed as less than fully human. Well, first of all, that all the verses we just looked at you know, counter that idea. But also, Sklar says, this is like how in English we trade a player or transfer an employee. That individual in our society today is not viewed as less than human, but we do use terms appropriate for the commercial context because they are selling their services. Sklar says, to say that servants are property or inherited is not to put them on the level of furniture any more than to say that a sports star being traded puts him on the level of a stock. But what about this idea of being passed on as an inheritance to their sons after them to receive as a possession forever? Well, what's in view here is this idea that the head of household is entrusted with the well-being of all its members. John Harris says, a foreigner can't even permanently buy land in Israel from a Hebrew because a Hebrew is not allowed to sell or lose his land past the time of the next jubilee. So unlike the Hebrew, the unemployed foreigner is stuck. He has nowhere to go. His needs would be dismissed when the employer died. What is in view here is the ongoing need of employment or provision for the foreigners so they weren't forced to return to a land that, for whatever reason, they had chosen to leave. So we tend to look at this through the lens of oppression, but it's really a mercy that the responsibility for this person's employment is being passed on to the next generation. And it's important to remember that the servant in view voluntarily entered this agreement by choice for the provision of their need. Another thing that's difficult is just this idea of being under the control of another. Sklar says there's no denying that masters could use such control to dehumanize and abuse, but this is true of any relationship of power, whether governments to citizens, employers to employees, parents to children. It's not the relationship of power itself that is dehumanizing or abusive, it's how that relationship is exercised. And so we're going to look at a few more verses. Servants had legal protection in Israel. Masters did not have absolute control. We already saw justice about them being released in the case of abuse. Well, Deuteronomy 23 says, You shall not give up to his master a slave who has escaped from his master to you. He shall dwell with you in your midst, in the place that he shall choose within one of your towns. Wherever it suits him, you shall not wrong him. Other other translations say, You shall not mistreat him. Don't be cruel. You shall not oppress him. And this was similar to the experience of paid employment in a cash economy when performed under humane conditions required by law. One person submits to the authority of another and provides labor in exchange for certain benefits, whether money like now or food and shelter like in ancient Israel. This was a mercy because it was protection from poverty, provision of regular food and shelter, and a place in a stable family. It was literally a lifesaver back then. And lastly, there's another reason we know that what is in view here is not the slave trade as we think of it. Uh, Remember our principle of looking to the New Testament to see if something is reinforced there. Letting scripture interpret scripture. Well, if you look at 1 Timothy 1, verses 9 through 10, um, enslaving someone is, is put on the level of those things that are defined as being ungodly and sinful. And there's a slide. I won't read that whole verse for the sake of time. Okay, so I know we took a hot minute for that, but I sincerely hope that it has been relieving to your conscience if you have felt burdened by this passage because it was a tricky one. Now, we're going to move on from that to this idea of an Israelite in service to a foreigner. Verses 47 through 55. On the topic of Israelite brothers and sisters who have hired themselves out to a wealthier foreigner in their midst, permanent servitude was not to be. Why? Again, we should be pretty familiar with this by now. Because they are servants of the Lord who had delivered them from Egyptian slavery into his permanent service. 
Verse 55 says, for it is to me that the people of Israel are servants. They are my servants whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. This didn't apply to non-Israelites since they hadn't experienced that redemption and were not covenant members, which just speaks to the significance of that legal covenant identity. But as we've seen pretty clearly above, God also cared greatly for how the foreign servant was treated, showing the opposite of dehumanization. And Sklar points out that this phrase we've seen a couple times about not treating the Israelite ruthlessly, that wasn't to then say, oh, but you can treat the foreigner ruthlessly. And I think the verses that we've looked at um, clarify that. Okay, so for redemption of people, in this case of an Israelite in servitude to a foreigner among them, we see that same threefold instruction as with redeeming property. Um, If an Israelite becomes poor and sells himself to a rich foreigner among him, then his relative can come redeem him, or the man himself can redeem himself once he's able. Or if those aren't possible, then he is released with his children in the Jubilee. Um, No one else can own them permanently, which we've said. They were permanent servants of their gracious redeemer and king. And the price that they would be paid for their redemption would be prorated based on the, how much time until the next jubilee. Okay, so we have seen that servitude was a reality and that it was a mercy of provision to those in need in this fallen world that does have poverty. But it was not the ideal. The ideal is set out in prophetic texts like Micah 4.4 and Zechariah 3.10 that describe a day in which the world will be set right and everyone will sit under their own vine and under their own fig tree. But although servitude was not the ideal, it was realistic in a fallen world with poverty. And it was so helpful that people sometimes chose to enter lifelong servitude willingly. And, Sklar points out, even when the ideal world comes, servitude will not stop. Indeed, in that world, he says, all the Lord's people will be permanent servants of the heavenly king and will consider it the greatest blessing. It was the duty of the Israelite master to imitate his heavenly master so well, so closely, that he gave his own servants a foretaste of that day. Wow, y'all, that is our God's heart. I mean, did you expect that in Leviticus 25? So may we worship him and may we reverence him and adore him. Okay, so what about Jesus? Where is Jesus in all of this? We believe the Bible is one story, Genesis to Revelation, every bit pointing to Jesus. So let's look quickly at Luke 4. It says, um, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor." And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So Jesus is quoting Isaiah 61. I know you guys looked at this in your study this week. Jesus is quoting Isaiah 61. And Isaiah is referring to Leviticus 25. Jesus is taking the principles of Jubilee and applying them to his mission. He says that he has come to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He's referring to the year of Jubilee. Isaiah uses the language of Jubilee to describe a future restoration of the people of God, and Jesus is saying that this passage finds its fulfillment in him. He had great concern for the poor, and he chastised those who did not. He expected his disciples to follow his example, and we see early Christians doing this in Acts 2 and 4. He fulfilled the Jubilee principle of liberty and release on an entirely new level, releasing people from physical sickness, demonic oppression, and above all, the debt of their sin, giving them present peace and a future hope that they were members of the family of God. 
Colossians 2.4 says, Jesus canceled the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Romans 6.17 says, you were once slaves of sin. He freed us from our slavery to sin and to death. And we've just looked at Hebrews recently, a verse that, um, or a passage that talks about Jesus sharing in our humanity so that by his death, he could free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Now, on this topic of return to land and family, in 1 John 3, 1 through 2, we hear, see what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. Beloved, we are God's children now. Romans 8, 15 says, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Jesus says in John 14, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I, have not, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? So Jubilee has come into this world. He has canceled our debts, promised us an eternal inheritance, and freed us from slavery into adoption, into his family. But we live in this already not yet, right? These laws were given to, the, to them in Leviticus um, as a taste of an eternal, the eternal reality. And so it is with us now. In Romans 8.1, we hear there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. We are already redeemed in Christ, set free from slavery to sin, to walk in intimacy with our creator and savior, but... We still await the day when we will experience this more fully in heaven. Jesus started this blessing on a deeper level with his earthly ministry, and he will complete it when he returns in glory. And for this reason, his people cry, Amen, come Lord Jesus. But in the meantime, as we wait, oh, that we would say with the psalmist, Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. So, praise God and let's pray. Oh, Lord God, um, you are beautiful and we praise you for all the parts of your word. And I just praise you for the chance to study Leviticus with these women this year. Lord, we behold you as beautiful um, Help us adore you more. Help us image you to our brothers and our neighbors, the watching world around us, Lord, that you may be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.